Another great question. So where's the spoon for space and time? So if the vase, if the shape of the vase stands for space time, and then the sound of the vase is what we use to determine that shape. So in the case of space time, what kind of spoon can we use? There's no spoon big enough <laughs> that we can wield it and we will make waves in space time. But uh, remember that when stars orbit each other, right, they make waves. We can measure that. But even apart from that, if you remember from what I said, uh, a while uh, back, but we've, one of the things, one of the deep insights we've learned from quantum theory is that at the subatomic level, things are always a little noisy, they're always fluctuating, there's always some, some wiggling around going on, which means that space-time is always a little wobbly, it's always a little bit vibrating anyway. We don't actually need a spoon because of quantum effects, it's always vibrating a little bit. Not that we could measure that easily, it's tremendously hard, but in principle it's out there and in principle we can just listen to it. Very good question. Um, no, in general we wouldn't. Of course, you could imagine that you can tell whether something is made out of wood or whether it's made out of ceramic or glass, right? You can tell that by ear, but in general, no, we can't really calculate that. You would have to to use our methods, you really have to know beforehand what the object is made of. So, for example, you know, you need to know the elastic properties if it's glass or if it's a metal. You can go out and measure that and we need that for our calculations. But remember that we didn't really do this for the purpose of finding out the shapes of vases. We did it for space-time. And we know what space-time is made out of. Well, it's made out not of glass or metal, it's made out of just space and time. But the point is that just like we can measure the elastic properties of metal or the elastic properties of glass, we can also measure the elastic properties of space and time itself. Space-time can have curvature and um, that curvature is uh, an elastic response. You may wonder, well, how do you measure that? Well, you can measure that by looking out into the sky. When, for example, two stars orbit each other, and in fact that occurs all the time, lots of the stars that you see out in the sky are really several stars that orbit each other. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three stars that orbit each other. And when stars orbit each other, it's like two ducks in a pond. They orbit each other while making lots of waves. And stars orbiting each other, they make waves, they make ripples in space and time that can be measured and has been measured. Somebody won a Nobel Prize for that. It has been measured with enormous precision. Therefore, we do know the elastic properties of space and time. And therefore, th this vase, space and time vase, well, we know what its elastic properties are. Well, in the case of, um, of vases, um, we, we, we measure the sound of it, let's say with a microphone, and then um, you can decompose that sound into its component frequencies. In music, it would be called the overtones. If you have some uh, nicely shaped instrument, it will have a um, particular set of overtones that sound nice. And if you have something that has a different shape, then it will have an overtone spectrum. Um, particular frequencies that occur that don't sound so nice. But in any case, this is what makes up the sound, the, um, the so-called overtone. And for, um, for space and time, very hard to measure the quantum noise um, of space and time. And so far, you know, you're trying, but this hasn't been achieved yet. But in principle, we would do the same thing. We would measure the frequency spectrum and from that determine then what the, over uh, what the overtones are. And that is what makes the sound. That is what would then determine the shape. I guess I have two answers to that. In, in, in one sense, we are doing this. In one sense, we're doing that. Um, we can measure the curvature of space-time using telescopes. Namely, if you look out into the sky with a high-powered telescope, such as the Hubble Space Telescope, and you see that light is not traveling in a straight line. When there are big masses out there, galaxies, for example, then they curve space and light therefore also travels in the curve. And you get an image as if there was some blurring going on, as if you had some astigmatism in the eye, it's like astigmatism in the sky. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's a clear sign that space is curved. 
Um, it was predicted by Einstein and others, and it has been measured. However, that's not really the vibrations of space-time. It's just showing that it's curved. The vibrations of space-time are something that um, we also try to measure. And in fact, the vibrations of space-time are thought to have been the greatest just very briefly after the Big Bang, during a phase of so-called inflation. And those vibrations of space-time should have impacted um, the afterglow of the Big Bang that we nowadays see in the so-called cosmic microwave background. Just a few months ago, in March, there was a, uh, an announcement of a possible measurement of these so-called gravitational waves, these vibrations of space-time um, in experiments. This still needs to be firmed up, but there are more experiments on the way, and within a, a year or so, we'll know for sure whether we've actually seen those vibrations of space-time. Mathematically, you can describe a vase and its shape without thinking of it as being embedded in a three-dimensional space. You could think of the same vase as living in a five-dimensional space or a ten-dimensional space. The vase itself is a two-dimensional thing. So the surface of the vase is just a surface. It is measured in terms of square centimeters, I not see. in terms of I volume, see right? Okay, yeah. So, so it's fundamentally a two-dimensional thing, even though yeah. it lives in three dimensions. Yeah. The vase itself just this thin layer of it, the glass of it itself, that we would consider mathematically as a two-dimensional object. All right. But you're right, it lives, of course, in three dimensions. But the thing is about space-time that the three dimensions of space plus the dimension of time, all of them are curved in, in themselves. You can think of space-time as, as living inside a five or ten or whatever dimensional higher space, which is not curved, just like a vase which is curved, it is in a three-dimensional space that may not be curved. And we can't do everything just on a pen and paper and for yeah. a lot of the calculations, in particular if you really want to get shape from sound, mm -hmm. um, you actually need a computer for that and it just has to grind the numbers numerically. Good thing we don't have to do that by hand. Oh yeah. <laughs>